My name is Dora Damjanovic and I'll be the moderator of uh, this panel. I'm a young fellow and also a founder of uh, Youth Leadership Network. Uh, thank you for joining in our exciting panel today on role of youth in multilateral system. I won't be giving a huge intro because I want to put focus on our speakers and give them the main word and their five minutes to share their ideas and thoughts with us. But I will give a small introduction. So shortly, this session, as we all know, uh, but for those that do not know, will generate ideas and recommendations regarding ways to integrate youth more effectively into the multilateral system as proposed by the UN Secretary General for inclusion in the GL21 final report with the participation of youth organizations as well as others experienced in the multilateral system. So I would like, love to greet our six speakers. So I, Simon, Tibor, Dorothy, Flavia and Alia. I'm really sorry if I mispronounced some of your names, but <laughs> I wasn't sure how to originally pronounce them. But I will give you the opportunity to, before you give your speech, to shortly introduce yourself and tell us who you are and your full name correctly. And we are all very excited to hear your speeches. So I would like to start this panel with the first speaker, Suvai. I give you the floor and we are all very eager to hear your speech. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Suvai Gunasekaran. I currently live in Chicago, uh, Illinois, um, where I'm a uh, postdoc doing research in cardiac MRI. So I have a lot of science experience and have worked a lot with youth in the multilateral system as I'm the coordinator, a focal point coordinator for the UN major group for children and youth um, and the science um, platform interface. Also in Chicago, I'm the vice president of the UN Women Chicago chapter. And so we work a lot with um, different organizations to promote um, fundraising activities for women um, internationally through UN Women. Um, I wanted to keep my uh, statements very short because I know we wanted to lead mostly to discussion to discuss how we can work on things. And just a few comments I have to make on, uh, you know, I think it's really wonderful that the UN is really supporting youth to be involved in the multilateral system. Um, and the more voices we can hear is always better because everyone's experience is different. And if we aren't inc incorporating new voices with new ideas, then we're really going to be missing um, some critical aspects to improve um, you know, everyone's lives. Uh, the one thing with youth is that, um, you know, uh, as smart as they can be, it takes a lot of practice and time to develop all the skills to develop a real system. And once they get to that stage, then, you know, they're not youth anymore. And so um, it's harder to maintain that strong base um, with younger people. And so I think it really needs to kind of come from the top of having a good system in place to allow the youth to flourish um, without requiring them to really um, structure things on their own. Um, so that's all I wanted to say to start off with. I want to let other people discuss and we can obviously talk more after. Thank you, Simone. That was a very good introduction, especially part of how important it is to hear all of the voices. I think that's the main highlight and topic of this session. So the next I would like to ask Simone with your contribution. Okay, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for, um, for the floor. Uh, my name is Simone Romano, and I am the national uh, coordinator of the United Nations Youth Association um, of Italy. And it's a pleasure to, to be here. So thank you to the Youth Leadership, Leadership Network and to the Academy for having me. Uh, I'm really excited to hear from you also new ways to, um, to include the young in the multilateral system. As a, as a United Nations Youth Association, we were born in 1947 and we, just, and we are keeping up with the same aim to include young people and to empower them 
to have a say, to have a, a say in the in the international organization at an international stage. Um, we are working actually through our committees in Gorizia, Milan, Naples, Turin, and Rome, and through webinars, workshops, and and, and not so far in time also with institutional trips. And so now today the pandemic has shook our activities as everyone else is, and so we are here to to together together and our experiences and our diversity in order to create new launch pads, new activities, and new networks for young people to to be included. And so I won't take any further any further uh, time in order to let other people also to to present themselves. And I would also like to um, to, to stress the point that. Um, also, the, um, the Jewish rabbi Hillel Elder used to say that uh, um, if we are not now, when, and if um, not us, who? So maybe uh, we could focus on that, and I can look forward to hear from you also. What could be new ways to engage people in the multilateral uh, system, and how could they have their say? Uh, in this process in order to structure their future and the future of um, of the world and in order to challenge also the, the global threats we are facing today. So thank you for your attention and I can wait to from hearing, hearing you. Bye. Thank you, Simone. Thank you. And I would really agree with you. This In these times of pandemic, it is actually a really good opportunity to somehow participate, for youth to participate, because they have more time and social media is more active than ever, just to involve them a little bit more in various activities of different organization. Thank you once more. And I would like to invite uh, Tibor to share his ideas with us. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, may I consider myself as an intern in this group of people, <laughs> if you are ready to cohort me. Um, I, I'm coming uh, from a bigger picture perspective and a different generation. First of all, uh, I admire the patience which I have witnessed even in, in the first couple of presentations where um, the panel participants with a lot of humility are expecting uh, inputs and expecting how the situation might bring up new opportunities. Why I'm raising this point? Because I think your generation is practically heavily impacted, heavily impacted by a series of economic and financial crisis, not just 2007 and 8, but starting potentially with the turn of the century. Then on the top of that, the COVID-19. And as an net result of that, probably many years of um, early work and job opportunities were missed in the post-2008 period. Now, because of the coronavirus, there is a, a second punch uh, impacting young people probably even more than anyone else. And uh, the generation behind you, uh, because of the limitations in the, in the schooling, uh, might uh, suffer as well from what is unfolding. So uh, I think this generation is impacted heavily. Uh, what is inherited by your generation is a couple of unfinished business on the so-called wicked problems. The unfinished uh, business uh, of the climate change uh, uh, issue, the unsolved issue of uh, the SDGs, especially in light what happened uh, in the coronavirus crisis. I think the implementation of the SDGs by 2030 is for me, uh, is under a, under a big, big question mark. Uh, in addition to that, probably still we don't know how uh, to handle in the future pandemics, which might be similar or more complicated than the coronavirus. The good news is that the generation you are representing has more resilience than many other generations. 
and I think you have to turn it around. And uh, because of what might be over the horizon, uh, you have to probably take control uh, without misusing the word which has been misused so many times recently, to take control of things. Uh, in practical terms, of course, I see many of the participants are from the UN system. And uh, it's very difficult, based on my experience, to provide great ideas how to break the intergenerational barriers which are built in the UN system with, whole, with the whole classification of who can be employed for a so-called P2 or P3 or P4 or P5 position, this classification means uh, a built-in uh, gerontocracy. The, the way ahead is probably to find a way around uh, some of these um, barriers for you, to be smart, agile, based on your uh, stronger resilience. Uh, to, to see how, for example, the gray areas of what international government organizations are doing or the UN is doing, where their mandate ends and there is no more mandate, where the different organizations' mandates are not complementary to, to each other. So how in these areas uncovered you can deploy your, your knowledge and expertise. There is another big advantage you have. Uh, of course, right now, still we are handling uh, with issues of the third industrial revolution, like nuclear and the danger posed by nuclear weapons. The second industrial revolution, oil, we are trying still to, to handle the, the problems uh, created for climate change. And we are trying to handle the first industrial, uh, industrial revolution gift of coal. So while still it's an issue uh, on which the jury is out, the fourth industrial revolution is coming. And no one knows better what the fourth industrial revolution is about that, than your generation. And historically, that was very much true because in the 1930s, the, the Italian team of Fermi, who were very much behind putting in place theory underpin, underpinning the nuclear chain reaction, they were in their 20s. So I think all this should be a bit of an inspiration for you, but my advice to you is um, get us boomers out of the place and uh, take control of issues which are uh, issues of your generation. Thank you, Tibor, so much. I couldn't agree with you more. So this generation is the crucial one because we are going to deal with a huge economic crisis. We are dealing with, we will deal also with a global crisis and we will deal with the climate crisis, COVID crisis. So this is the moment and that's why we are here today and in the future, just to wake up that consciousness and to wake all, every single individual and to just close the gap, try, trying to close the gap between older generations and the young generations and to finally start to cooperate, to solve these burning questions together. Thank you, thank you, Tibor. Uh, the next one, uh, the next speaker that I would like to call will be Dorothy. The floor is yours. Yes, hello. Um, first of all, thank you, Doro, and also thank you to the World Academy of Art and Science and the Youth Leadership Network and the Leadership Project for this great initiative. So I am a junior professional officer at the UN Geneva. I'm working in political affairs and partnerships at the Office of the Director General. And the Director General is um, basically like her key role is facilitating international cooperation in broad range of areas from SDGs to security to humanitarian affairs, and also always the inclusion of youth. So we already heard a lot of good points and I, I want to also um, comment on those. Um, first of all, well, 
this young generation is really like the biggest ever. We have 1.8 billion people between 10 and 24. So we really have like a great power here. And as we already heard, young people are resilient, well-versed in technological and economic disruption um, and mobilized for these, uh, what was just called wicked problems from climate change to also racial justice, um, gender equality and peace. And um, as Suve mentioned um, in her opening statement, I do believe that the UN already recognized their tremendous potential and gives a lot of entry points. Nevertheless, um, the EU still does not enjoy a full-fledged seat at the table. Um, they are encouraging steps like uh, the UN 75 initiative last year was really like a very big dialogue where um, you could really see how it helps to engage for the youth, what kind of new ideas can be created. And I believe that these um, partnerships can actually be the way forward um, for, for engaging with the youth uh, more often in the future. However, um, I believe there's much more to be done, especially when we look at multilateralism in general and also not only at the UN. Multilateralism is still dominated by big powers and state-driven processes. So, there's a lot that needs to be done. One thing is internally, like in multilateral organizations um, at the UN, there's, for example, the Young UN Initiative. And they did a survey, especially um, for um, staff members in the UN system. And that showed that the UN still is too bureaucratic. Like respondents said, it's, it's still sometimes too hierarchical, too process heavy with a lot of top-down processes. So first of all, we have a lot of things that are need to change internally. And that is certainly true for many in the multilateral organizations. And then looking at it from the outside, like um, for outside, it is often very difficult to understand where and how to interact with the UN and also with related organizations. And um, one of the results of the UN 75 dialogues was also that the UN is very often still too removed and, and too inaccessible to the younger generation. And um, in various multilateral um, bodies, we can see that many decisions are still taken behind closed doors by member states, which also uh, leads me now to my way forward. Like who, I want to give some uh, ideas maybe for our discussion, like where, what are the points where we can start? Um, so internally, what we can see is that there is a requirement for stronger engagement with young professionals working in and with the UN. They have a unique skill set. I believe that um, we are really like a generation now that is already born and raised with digital technologies, but there is still this difficulty to break the internal organizational barriers in the organization. Then we have the problem that there is no equal level of playing field for the youth around the world. 90% of this 1.8 billion are living in developing countries. So there's just a, a whole different dimension to start with. Um, including them into um, these dialogues um, also will create huge dividends for things like the sustainable development goals. And then lastly, like in the whole multilateral arena, I believe that there must be more involvement of the youth in decision-making. This means opening the closed doors. And while like um, many things like UN um, 75, but also youth um, delegates to the General Assembly, these are already really good ideas. And um, I believe that everyone um, at the UN and other stakeholders um, should be a driving force from this. And this goes from senior management to staff members to member states. The potential for reform has never been better. And this is going to be my the point where I stop. Um, I believe we are very committed young people. We have unprecedented technologies. And as we, as we just heard already from Simona as well, this is a special situation that is a momentum for change. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy, for your amazing speech and a lot of new, fresh ideas. Uh, I think we also all agree that to change this outdated system, we need to give youth the feeling 
that they can change something, not only by rioting on the street, but they can actually be involved in the decision making processes. That is also something that we are striving to do and to make that bridge between them and the organizations that actually have some impact in this world. Uh, the next speaker I would like to invite is Flavia. Sorry. Young people must be taken seriously in order to build an equal and better world for all. This is the title of my presentation. I am thankful to the organizers to have me here. As a member, I represent the Global Young Academy. However, the responsibility of this presentation is only mine. I am a social anthropologist from Brazil working on impoverished children and their families. What is your first community memory of childhood? Not the ones taking place at home, but elsewhere. And I give you two seconds to think. One of my first memory of childhood is embedded in a sense of injustice, shame, and urgency. Seeing human beings such as myself begging in the streets and looking for food in the garbage thrown carelessly in the filthy floor ground. I built this presentation in three parts. First, I will talk about why can we make take children seriously and young people, obviously, the limits to do that and how we can take that. We start with why. I go, according to Christina Toring, professor at St. Andrews University, without children's and young people views, the picture of a given subject is incomplete. We need to address them in order to get a big and comprehensive view of all kinds of change we want to address. Moreover, we need to let them decide how they want to build a better world and an equal society. As adults, our role is to support them. The work is theirs. The world is theirs. Now I'm going to talk about the limits. There are at least, there are plenty of limits. The legal limits, the fact that children and adolescents are not considered citizens in their own rights, social, cultural, and historical limits, rather to change, harder to change, but with a potential to shape laws and conventions. People's mentality is still to be changed in order to the pro to see in order to see the prospects of these groups. Structural barriers, poverty, social inequalities, famine, lack of schooling and difficult access to school, gender inequalities, practice that do not recognize children and young people as social agencies, in the family, at school, in science, and all levels of political system, and so on. All these challenges must be addressed locally, but also in a planetary south-south-north relationship. How can we try to achieve that? Science, research on the basis of childhood and youth studies, not disturbing children and young people to take their place in this planetary turning point. Politically, politics. We need to develop public policies that not only protect our youth, but also engage them in constructing a larger con concept of citizenship, civil society, push forward these transitions. Why am I talking about children as well as youth? My research and the research of my mentoring group have shown the potential of children to shape their own world but going forward to shape the world for everybody. We have various examples that catch the media in the last years, such as Malala and Greta Thunberg. With COVID-19 catastrophe, we have a real opportunity to make a planetary change, address, addressing the growth 
of far-right authoritarian regimes, fascism, faces environmental crisis and climate change, inequalities and poverty. Thank you, Flavia, for your amazing presentation. And this really is a planetary turning point that we are living right now and addressing the issues as a gender inequality, social injustice and poverty. It's just the crucial burning question. And also giving you to the most, the more responsibility to deal with those questions is something that will definitely, the first thing that will lead us to a better future. So now I would like to ask our last speaker, Alia, to give her speech. And Alia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Doro. And I would first like to start by thanking the World Academy for Art and Science for this initiative and all the organizers. As well, I would like to thank uh, Martin Ostermeyer from Young UM and Natalie Khaled from Young Esquire for nominating me. My name is Alia Sabrio. I'm an Economic Affairs Assistant at UN Esco. I'm also a member of the Young Esco. Um, my experience with the youth so far has been uh, mentoring the youth on um, coming up with solution business idea to different challenges existing in their countries and uh, at the same time organizing social events for the youth. Good morning, good evening from wherever you are. One would think that there are limits to youth integration within the UN. Well, let me bring you the experience drawn explain about Young UN. It is a global and inclusive decentralized cross-UN network of more than 2,000 change makers working across the UN system in 80 plus countries. Young UN is open to UN staff of all contract types and age groups, working towards a shared vision of a UN that fully embodies the principles it stands for. It recognizes the needs for challenges of the century and are committed to play our part and provide a voice for UN staff, share knowledge, advise with the UN senior management, and become a partner in implementing new ideas and reforms. Whereas, Young Esqua is a local hub of Young UN with the support of the Esqua's executive secretary, Dr. Led. It has been launched in 2019 years to enable the strengths, foster innovation, and demonstrate its added value to the UN system and member states. Being a derivative of UN, it is actively working as part of its working groups led by the Office of the Secretary General on Reform. Here I cite three. Okay, I'm sorry. So I was saying, as the said, said, about you and at 70 people. Connecta, which is inspired by Esquire's talent pool, pool access accessible to managers to, de to deploy them based on skills as at this strong on projects like the Sharing is Caring initiative, which was launched post the Beirut 2020 blast where young ESQA activists collected toys and clauses to distribute via local channels to the affected kids from the blast. Furthermore, social youth events are organized and implemented by the youth station and culture spirit within UNESCO. When we look at how UNESCO is integrating the youth in its mandate, we see that it uses a youth marker to monitor the level of youth integration in its different projects. A youth focal point in each cluster would res be responsible to train on the meaning and importance of the youth marker, as well as to monitor youth inclusion in the projects by marking each activity, either by youth focused, youth responsive, or youth unresponsive. This technique helps regulate the unresponsiveness to use keeping it between a range of below 10% to none. Now, you ask me, 
how can use be a complementary driving force and force multiplier for intergovernmental organizations and processes in charge of global issues? Well, I for your speech, I feel so sorry that I and I guess the others couldn't hear everything that you said due to some connection problems, but I hope you can maybe sum it up a little bit in a discussion. That would be great. I, we are all very eager to hear your fresh ideas. Now, since Alia was, yes, now since the Alia was the last speaker, I would like to open a discussion. If anybody wants to comment or start a discussion or ask questions. There is a question for you, uh, as you can see. So the solution you're presenting are very in, in initiative, opening doors for young people, leveraging new technologies, granting youth a seat at a decision-making table, etc. Why is this not happening? Why are UN decision-making bodies still comprised of mostly older people? Could you please reply? Yes, of course. Um, Thank you, Martin, for your question. Um, first of all, I would like to um, respond to the first question. Why is it not happening? And I think I also gave um, probably a kind of negative outlook, but I also want to give a positive one. So I disagree. Why is this not happening? I do believe that this is already happening. It's just not enough. Just to also give us here some examples so we also can talk about some positive things and some things that we can actually duplicate and replicate. There are initiatives where like um, the UN, like also my office, for example, is talking actively with students. We are trying like with um, when there are panels, like uh, last year we had the Geneva Peace Talks and Geneva Peace Week to actually put in moderators that are young as well and not just like the, the, the people who are always um, on the panels. Also within the UN, I do believe that more and more um, bodies and um, institutions are actually opening up to the youth. However, very often this still happens like on the side, there's like a separate youth track that is not fully integrated um, into, the, um, into the summits and into the program. So this should be like more mainstream topic. But coming to the second aspect of uh, Martin's question, why are you in decision-making still comprised of mostly older people? Well, there is a certain heritage and, and kind of like path dependency in multilateralism still. Integrating the youth, I believe, is still something that's rather new, like granting um, them a seat at the table. So especially like in multilateral bodies, what we can see is that a lot of politics is still happening, for example, between member states. So without member states actually opening up to including other people, and this is not only valid for youth groups, it's also valid for other like civil society groups, the UN can only do so much. But then of course, and that's the second aspect, um, the UN itself um, must be more inclusive. There are still internal limits as well. We do see, um, leadership styles that require like a bit of modernization. And I also believe that the UN is very aware. The Secretary General has started a lot of dialogues on this. And um, in this year, there's also going to be like the follow-up report of the UN 75 dialogue where there are concrete um, recommendations. Um, so there are already uh, 12 declarations. One of them um, is that the disintegration of the youth. So I do believe that there is a strong commitment. And then, um, as I said, as a third point, why is it still comprised mostly of older people? Is also, of course, a lack of power for young people. So I hope that um, responds to the question. Thank you. My personal experience, I worked in the United Nations for a year and a half in uh, Vienna and me and my colleagues, we were among the youngest there. We were interns and we were on uh, UN conferences every day as it was part of our job. And we got a lot of new fresh ideas. And we, when we told our ideas as uh, young people to our boss, 
uh, bosses, they were really happy and excited to hear those ideas. And they were surprised because they never even thought of engaging maybe youth in decision-making processes. And few of our ideas, they actually, um, they applied them. So it was a success. So I would say the main problem is there are not enough initiatives because um, organizations like UN, they don't maybe think in that way to engage youth so much. And the other problem is a uh, lack of knowledge in young people because young people think that, oh, no way I will be able to make a decision or be part of a decision-making process at a huge organization such as United Nations. But the truth is actually that it is possible. We just need to make a bridge. So we also have one question from Thomas. Is it time for an independent youth UN, global instead of inter-nation state? Any comments? Sure, I can um, just share a few uh, thoughts. Uh, I, think, um, I think there are a lot of great organizations such as um, the ones that we're speaking at and people are a part of today that have a lot of youth involvement. And so there are kind of many kind of uh, youth um, UN international groups. Um, however, I think one of the bigger issues is that we really want to, we don't want to continue separating the UN and then a youth UN as, you know, two separate entities. The goal is that we want everything to be coordinated together. And so by continuing to focus on specific youth led things, I think takes away from our goal of really having, uh, you know, that generational um, connection um, with within the larger UN and other organizations as well. And uh, speaking to the other point, um, while I haven't worked directly in the UN itself in the organizations that I'm part of um, in the major group and within Chicago, I think there is a, a tendency for as, you know, as someone is part of the uh, system and the organization, if they develop more skills, they you know, get more expertise. I think it's harder for people to let new young people in when they feel like they know what they're doing, what's going on. So I think that's just a general human issue though, to not want to give up the control of what you think is best. And so uh, we really need to demonstrate the, um, like the great work that youth have done to open up the minds of older people to try to incorporate that in. and. It has to really be a um, an intentional aspect to incorporate youth. It's not going to happen if we just hope it will. And the next comment is from Simon. Okay, uh, if I may add something, um, first of all, thank you for, for the interesting questions. Um, I'm very agree with what was today and Dorothy was was talking about because there are a lot of um, young people and young youth association which are working. And together, and maybe as Dirty was, was seen before, there is maybe it's not enough. Uh, there are lots of networks that are allies, and maybe we don't even know about each other. And so maybe this could be fruitful also to to implement the this part and to to have a say all together um, on the global press we were talking about because also it's very clear from the from the UN 75 questionnaire and answers as Dorothy was mentioned before that the young people are very much worried uh, um, about the climate change but also environmental protection and they are ready to ready to take up issues to take up their say I'm sorry um, talking about the technological uh, innovation but also to reduce the digital divides and and we have really the chances to have our, our say and to allow them to, to have their own say in the multilateral system. And also to responding to the previous question that was made before, the, um, here in Italy, uh, also we find some difficulties in the, in from um, coming from the down to the top process to the civil society, because also the, the Italian university, most, most of the time do not give enough space to, to, to the young people to, to have the opportunity to, to, um, to drag them out of the comfort zone uh, and to make them experiences that could be very fruitful for them to, uh, to explore their future and to feel the international system as um, effective to their own lives. Because most of the time, um, maybe the, 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 the generation, I'm sorry, is more aware 
of the threats they are facing today. But there are lots of people, lots of young people that don't even know about the existence of these networks and maybe the, they are not perceiving the threats as real and concrete. So um, our goal as an youth association and the kids, but also as international um, individual in the international society is to be convincing and to be accountable on that issue and to let them perceive about the necessity to, to increase. So I absolutely agree with you. And I think that there is more to done also from people who are not dealing with these issues like we are doing today now. Okay. Thank you. Thank Thank you, Simon. Uh, the next comment from uh, Nicola. Uh, first of all, I introduce myself. I'm Nicola. I'm uh, from the same association of Simone. I'm a member of MSOI Unia Italy. So first of all, thank you very much to the World Academy of Arts and Science for allowing me to be a contributor to this panel. Uh, I found your um, proposals, your suggestions, very insightful. In particular, I have a question uh, regarding what uh, Mr. Uh, Tibor said uh, concerning the COVID pandemic situation and the impact that uh, the COVID pandemic had and is going to have in the future, in the near future, on uh, the implementation of the SDGs uh, before 2030. So I, uh, I completely agree with him when he said that um, there is going to be a lot of problems concerning the implementation, especially um, about the, in my opinion, about the economic and uh, social components of sustainable development goals. But at the same time, I wanted to ask uh, all of you, what do you think about the environmental component? So uh, if this break uh, of uh, economic activities may in effect bring a change in uh, the way that we perceive uh, industries and all the industrial production processes. And at the same time, I would like to ask uh, all of you, uh, how do you think that the civil society, in particular youth, may have a role in this transition towards uh, the post-pandemic uh, environmental uh, deal with uh, such crisis. Thank you very much. Would somebody like to answer Nicole's questions? Flavia? I would like to make a comment. I uh, don't know how, how long I have, but I guess it's very, just one minute or two, right? Just I wanted to say that the comment I, I ref referred to my comment is just stunning for me that in this panel, there are so many young people but I, I saw three other panels and there were almost non young people. So I want to question that and to raise the, the awareness about this. We are, this. we are together, we are in the same society and whatever, whatever is good for vulnerable people like young people is good for everybody. Uh, regarding the momentum, I absolutely agree. I think it's, the, it's a good moment. I mean, it's a very special moment we have living now. Some people talk about the new normal, but I, I am expected the new. I don't want the normal. The normal is not enough for us. It's not enough for me. So what I'm expecting, what I'm looking for, what I'm working for is to build another society, another society where the environment matters, where we tackle the poverty and inequality problems, gender, gender and, and uh, social inequalities, and also science and arts and the mind and the body, a new momentum for, for the whole planet we, where we can see things different, act differently and have a better life. Thank you, Flavia. And just to uh, answer a couple of your points, uh, so why a lot of young people are on this panel is because this panel was made in a cooperation, collaboration with Youth Leadership Network. And to add uh, on a comment that Mahendra uh, said, he said, excellent suggestion to bring all the diverse youth organization under a common umbrella such that they can access the multilateral system with a united voice. Uh, youth Leadership Network, uh, I and four of my colleagues, we are the founders. Uh, we are trying to do exactly that. We are trying to 
unite youth organizations and young people and to give them a voice and access to the multilateral system. So I just wanted to add that comment. Any more questions or comments? Um, maybe just um, adding something for momentum of change. I think we're currently definitely at a pathway, like it can either develop positively, but be also also there that this develops negatively. There is definitely momentum. The pandemic has shed a spotlight on many inequalities that most often affect young people. Like um, no matter where we live in, like um, even in like industrialized or developing countries, there's a huge discussion among inequalities and in education, students are not going to school, like virtual um, schooling is not working. Or then also in other countries, there are students who have not gone to school since the beginning of COVID. So I believe that, it, that there is a discussion going on around these topics and that is the momentum of change that we have. Unfortunately, what is happening right now still is that and that's what we heard frequently already, like the ones that were already left behind are really at the risk and already are being left behind even further. So I think um, I am optimistic, but I'm optimistic that we have many topics that are now part of more mainstream discussions. But that does not necessarily mean yet that we are on our way to something uh, more positive. Uh, to build over on what uh, Dorothy was saying with the COVID and things changing, it's really forced everyone to um, have to grapple a lot more with technology, doing all these virtual events and um, really embracing um, the different ways to connect, uh, which requires a lot of, you know, different computer apps and programs and things like that. And I think that really um, is supporting the youth and younger people who are very involved with the technology and requires people who were less um, invested in it or using it to also um, understand the power that it has and the ability it has to connect others. And so I think hopefully that'll help pull younger people to get involved and um, show support and be able to foster the, those collaborations uh, amongst generations. Thank you, Savai. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, we have a lot of amazing comments in the chat section. But I would like to propose one question to Tibor as a member of a generation that is older than us. Uh, how do, uh, do you think, what kind of solution would be to engage youth more in the decision-making process? My first point is, um, having listened to, to all the amazing comments, that I don't think that your generation should wait until you are invited to the table. So you will have to create your niche or niches to show an initiative. And it's not you who are the demander, but it's the other generation who is asking to have access to that table. And um, as I mentioned, there is an Achilles heel of intergovernmental organizations the mandates are very pedantic. So these are very well-defined mandates for specialized organizations, intergovernmental organizations, and it's very difficult for them to go beyond the mandate or to go beyond what member states are allowing, for example, the organization secretariat to do. And many of your members are, are with secretariats, interns or, or um, uh, young, um, young professionals. So there is a need to, to figure out, to map, okay, what are, the, what are the most recent issues? To give you one example, and, and I think Dorothy raised the point about entry points. So if I take Geneva, in, in one place, uh, you have a couple of organizations, of course, World Health Organization and ILO and ITU, World Trade Organization, and if I look upon the challenge created by COVID, this is a transdisciplinary problem. And none of these organizations are allowed to look upon it beyond their narrow mandate. And the most interesting is when a problem is spilling into another domain, in, into another wicked problem, 
is further enhanced by that particular spillover effect. So take it as an example, as a, what kind of entry point. This could be in between the mandates, the cracks, the Achilles heel of organizations, where, where they, have, they have a point where, where, where they are uh, very much defenseless. On, on issues, to give you one example, uh, there is an uh, entity which is very well functioning, the UN planners, planner officers, informal network. So those people usually come together twice a year and uh, those people are not your generation. But you could do the same as, for example, how, to give you one uh, subject matter, how the overall external environment has been changed as a result of the COVID-19, as a result of the financial and economic difficulties generated by the, by the COVID-19. And what might be on the, over the horizon, for example. And if it is an informal network, uh, you are not um, uh, put in a straight jacket where you cannot speak out or, or your mind because many of those professionals in the UN system, they will have to watch how far they can go and they have to use euphemies. They have to be not too negative, uh, not going beyond their mandate. And these are additional opportunities beyond the technologies I mentioned to you, or this AI and communication and robotics and, and, and all, in all these technologies, the entrepreneurs, the titans are young people. They started in their twenties. So you have to turn around the table. It's not you who are asking to be invited to the table, but you are creating your own table. You are creating your own niche areas. You are having a meaningful discussion and then you decide how to and whom to invite to that table. So it's, it's, it's you have to, turn around this whole issue. Thank you, Tibor. This was very insightful. Thank you for your comment. Anybody else who would like to add something? So I got a question at the questions and answer um, from Kenneth, who asked me, how may I learn more about your organization, its mission and initiatives? So in a chat, I've sent you Youth Leadership Network uh, domain website. So anyone who wants to reach or find out everything that we do, everything that we organize and all of our initiatives, feel free to contact us anytime. We will be there to help you. But just to introduce you a little bit more about YLN, as I can see a lot of people are interested in the message that I got. So YLN is non-governmental organizations that my colleagues, Marco Vitello, Carlo Lucian, Dina Draghia, uh, Jody and I made. It's a young generation, uh, it's a young organi organization which aim is to unite young organizations and youth that have a similar goal, similar aims, and to put them all under one same umbrella and to make a bridge between them and big organizations and to finally involve youth in the decision-making processes and to give more power to youth and to strengthen their voice and to show them that their voice matters. And we are doing that through uh, various of conferences and we're also trying to do that through art. And also what we are trying to do is to connect young ambitious people worldwide. They don't need to be involved in any kind of organization. Uh, they can be just young individuals that are eager to change something that are very tired of outdated, outdated system that we live in and just want to be part of a modern change that is happening. So uh, luckily we have an uh, amazing group of people and day by day we are meeting new people from climate change activists, from people that are fighting for human rights or for people that just want to better tomorrow. And we are all uniting and we are all connecting and we are striving to make a global network of young people that want to change the world together. So as I said, spread the word and if you want to join, we will be very willing to have new, young, ambitious people. Maybe just if I could add something to of what uh, Tibo just said, because I like the idea of basically reversing also the legitimacy of um, forums, because by creating own forums, it also shows that um, other like bodies of forums only have legitimacy when including young people. 
And with this, I just want to go like one time from this kind of like higher level to the very individual level of all of us uh, sitting here. I believe that it is also our responsibility and I 100% agree that there are a lot of obstacles and limits, but to constantly push for our own inclusion and also to keep pushing when we grow in our own careers and our own personal development. So we can see is that even within like our own work, our own um, like when we will be studying and so on, there are a lot of opportunities actually to push for the inclusion of young people, of other opinions. It's already when organizing um, a panel or an event that we kind of had this voice in my in our head, not only like uh, oh the panel, there should be gender parity on the panel, but also, oh, there should be like age diversity on the panel. And I believe that all of us at the moment, we still have, like we already have a lot of power and hopefully we also will have even more power and it's us who should already like really embed in ourselves the idea that youth as gender, as as a diversity integrated minority should be something that we ourselves constantly push. But this is just on a very like individual. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you for an amazing comment. There is also one more comment from Mahendra, uh, who is giving us constructive comments throughout the discussion. And thank you for that. I shall read it. Uh, Mahendra said, we need to start educational reforms to introduce multilateralism and multilateral system in schools, colleges, and universities, such that as they enter professions, they have awareness. Attending multilateral meetings will not provide the training to participate in meetings with substance. The UN should consider developing youth programs such as the UN School Day, when high school students represent countries and so on. For the youth, the focus of discussion and negotiation should be global challenges we are facing. The question is which UN agency or organization to take a lead here. So it is mostly about the educational system reform and to involving organizations and especially other, other organizations, not only United Nations, in changing the educational system and to giving youth the, the involvement in the decision-making processes. But maybe you'd already know from some UN sources which exactly body would be that. I don't know at the moment what exactly which exact uh, institution uh, the person is uh, mentioning here. And the next question is from David. And David asks, I would like to take Tibur's turn the tables metaphor on another step. In the spirit of and need of being in this together, has the YLN, Youth Leadership Network that I mentioned, considered inviting some old to be considered for membership? Youth Leadership Network, as we said, is trying also to remove the gap between older and younger generation. So yes, of course, we are always ready to have somebody to advise us and to mentor us as well and to help us. So feel free, no matter what age you are, to contact YLM. Okay, so we have 10 more minutes left. Uh, Tibor, did you raise your hand? Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, in my introduction, I, I mentioned that uh, I, I would like to aspire for an internship in your organization. And this is very much in line with the turn, turn the table concept. So I would very much advise that you remain in the driving force as the young generation. And whoever you add as cohorts, potentially me and others, we are just trying to learn from the new thinking you have to, you have to deploy. There is a, uh, there is a, there is a aspect of uh, what might be ahead of all of us, where in case the financial economic uh, COVID related uh, repercussions are further aggravated, I think the results will be longer lasting than in 2007 and 2008. It will put an additional pressure on you because these issues will have to be sorted out eventually by you, by your generation. 
the amount of uh, financial uh, stimulation injected in the in the world economy is so huge that people are see, uh, uh, talking about the next 30 to 50 years until those injections will be neutralized. The 10 trillion dollars worldwide, which uh, has been just injected during the last 18 months. So the, these, are, these are issues which are, will be landing in your lap. And you have to make sure that all the time you are convinced that these issues, since you will inherit them, the sooner the better if they are handled by you. And again, you have to be smart because I don't think that it will be easy just to get a chair at the existing, at the existing table. On education of, of Shad, uh, he, he raised the point about how, how to handle um, education. Uh, of course, the easy answer is uh, UNESCO, but uh, I, I would like to recall something, uh, not because uh, I, I would like to overemphasize things we have been doing, but my organization 10 years ago, we, we started something where uh, massive open online courses uh, were used to reach out massively to young people. We had around 3,000 people who were um, uh, enlisted in, in those courses, coupled with science and technology conferences, presence of young people. But this is passé. This was 10 years ago. MOOC was, um, it, it's, a, it's a dinosaur by now. But there are new things which are cutting edge. Uh, to give you one example, uh, digital twins. Uh, and uh, uh, creating some set of analytical tools to, to, to have foresight and, and futures. So the, all this area is an upcoming area. So merging education with, um, with, with real, real simulation of what's going on and what should be going on and what's not going on in these organizations no organization can do it because member states would ask them what the hell you are doing. But as young people, as a, a network, a network which has support from people who know the situation from inside without revealing anything which shouldn't be revealed, you might be in a position to put a mirror in front of those organizations through a uh, massive participation in education type of activity undertaken uh, with the coalition of um, organizations under the big umbrella of, of young people. So I just wanted to, to emphasize again, you have to go for cutting edge, new things, create your own things and move forward and define the, uh, the pace. Thank you, Tibor. This was really inspiring. <laughs> Thank you. If I may, um, um, just to say Simone, um, yes. for the I would really like to thank you, uh, Mr. Toth, to, to stress this point because um, also we as an institution, we, um, we would, our aim is also to, to provide an in-depth knowledge of what we are studying in the university. So uh, I think that I really agree when we say that we uh, as a person have to uh, to take up the challenge to uh, study, re-elaborate what we are studying and spread it all over way to the young generation. So um, this is also thanks. We are uh, the youth branch of our United Nations Association, which is based in, in Rome and that help us in doing so. And so I'm, I would really like to say that I'm really, I really, really agree with, with this point because it's very important also for us. And it is also difficult to try to reshape, to, um, to re-elaborate uh, certain difficult uh, knowledge that we are supposed to, to learn and to, to learn to embrace all together. And so thank you for, for your contribution, uh, Mr. Thoth. 
And as a matter of conclusion, and then I will leave the floor to, to Dora to thank you conclude the session because it's time. And, and if we if you want, we, we can um, keep in touch all together and to have a seat at each other's tables as we are doing together now uh, today. And it will be a pleasure also for us to, to keep to keep up with uh, keeping in touch all together. So thanks one one for all to to the academy and to the, to the YLN for this opportunity. I I hope that there will be more in the future. Thank you, Simon. And definitely we have all of your contacts and we will keep in touch. Uh, we have four more minutes, so two short comments from Flavia, and then as I can see, Alia, you also raise your hands. So Flavia, the floor is yours. Thank you. I also want to start saying it was a pleasure to, to take part in this panel. And what I wanted, to, just a comment, I don't want to be impolite and I don't want to, to be too provoking, but my idea is to push for the discussion. And I was thinking that most of the comments and most of what we are talking about applies largely to developed and Western contexts in countries. And I would like to think about societies that have been uh, colonies and still suffer from is the consequence of this past. So that is uh, my question to all of you and the audience. I thought provoking comment. <laughs> thank you, Flavia. <laughs> Alia? Yeah, thank you, Doria. I want to, um, as a concluding remark, uh, to thank you for this panel and uh, also like uh, Simon mentioned uh, to, to stay in touch and um, I wanted to say earlier that I also re relate to your example at uh, UN Geneva uh, myself being at uh, UN Esqua Beirut uh, uh, I um, also went through this uh, similar experience uh, going to the executive secretary and uh, telling her about uh, a process that needs to be automated because the system is outdated and uh, she if indeed she listened and um, so we can see the change happening so th this is a very good thing and we need to do more we need to um, work on uh, having a dialogue with, with um, country leaders in order to move things forward and ensure our future and sustainability. And um, also we would like to work on uh, pushing towards a future of work to be more flexible and agile. Uh, thank you, Dora, and um, good to be with everyone. Thank you. Thank you everyone and congratulations on an excellent session full of new fresh ideas. Uh, we have unfortunately no more time left, but uh, I guarantee you that we will stay in contact and further develop all of our ideas. I just want to thank you all for participating and see you soon.